you are listening to Breaking the Fourth Wall on Realm of the Mist Entertainment. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of Breaking the Fourth Wall. Uh, today, I'm joined by a man that has me in stitches already before we even recorded. He's dabbled in a little bit of everything, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to him on this interview. His name is Pat, um, and I don't want to butcher your last name. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the, first, uh, you're the first guy to ever show me that kindness. It's Pat Jankowitz, but I've heard it mispronounced every which way. There you go, Pat Jankowitz. All right, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that by the way it's spelled, which at the end of the show we're definitely going to spell it because I'm sure people are going to want to try and look you up. So, <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump right into this head first. And um, if you would, sir, I, I don't need a uh, you know resume or anything like that, but can you kind of tell the listeners your highlights, like some of the – best things you've done in your career? Oh, all right. Uh, I've written three books. I wrote Just When You Thought It Was Safe, A Jaws Companion, You Wouldn't Like Me When I'm Angry, A Hulk Companion, and The Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, A TV Companion. I write for Star Wars Insider. I write for Infinity Magazine. I write for uh, a magazine called Dark Side. All of them are available at Barnes & Noble. And I don't know if you, in your location of upstate New York, have a Vons or Ralphs, or even Safeway, but I believe they're carried there as well. Awesome. We definitely have Barnes & Noble. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Oh, one out of three ain't bad. Although Ralphs and uh, Ralphs is pretty good, and Vons. <laughs> nice. Awesome. And you had uh, kind of said before, do you still write for Fangoria Magazine? I've written for them. I've written a lot of huge stuff for them. Right now, they're quarterly. Oh, and okay. I've talked okay. to Dallas, the editor, but the problem is when they're doing it four times a year, they only need you when they're about to put something in. Ah. Uh... Does that make sense? They, they, they're four. Usually, they've been since they came back. They've been covering brand new stuff, and so like I'll go to them and say, "Hey, I've got this great article on Chud," and they're like, "We're covering Midsummer." <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay. So I'll we'll all just sit on my Chud article until you guys need it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but let's. But I'm talk- glad it's back from the dead. I, I'm very glad Fangoria's back from the dead. You know, it it, it should have never gone under. You know? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, let Let's talk about real, like, hard hitting literature, though. Have you ever written for uh, Reader's Digest? <laughs> <laughs> Great Scott, man! Reader's Digest. <laughs> uh, I, I hate to sound I hate to sound provincial, but is it even still published? I always see the dentist's office. <laughs> right, I was gonna say, I, you know, I read it every time I'm at the doctor or dentist. So I mean, there's got to be something there, right? Somebody's still making. My it. uncle Jerry, my uncle Jerry used to teach school on Mercer Island in Washington State, and he said he would grab old readers' digests, you know, when when he had spare time, you know, and whatever he was teaching the kids that week. My uncle Jerry, Jerry McDougall, would uh, uh, read the dramas in real life. You know, the, hey, I lived after getting mauled by a bear type stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he, he would milk it if, if it was like a gym day and it was raining, as it always is in Seattle, and they couldn't go outside. He would milk the, you know, the guy getting mauled by the bear or whatever to, to carry him through the hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All I but can... sadly, I've never written for Reader's Digest, and I assure you, Life Magazine, uh, anything else that's no longer published, I swear I've never written for. <laughs> All I can think <laughs> of, I, I could, I could see the guy's face, but I can't remember if it was, if it was Seinfeld or if it was King of Queens. But there, there was uh, the, the dad. And he was he was telling uh, he was so excited in one particular episode because a story that he sent in to Reader's Digest about his time in the service was getting printed, <laughs> and it was the the um, Sir Sandwich. Oh my gosh, so funny! <laughs> they um, did a Sir Sandwich reference in the nineties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, it had to be Seinfeld. I, the, uh, the Seinfeld writers I know they always pride themselves on the uh, they always pride themselves on the obscure. So that yeah. sounds like a, that, I would be I would be more surprised if it were King of Queens because 
the Seinfeld writers, uh, uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting the guy who, uh, oh, God, I just had a chat with the guy who did the, the, the Van Buren boys. He created yeah. the Van Buren. He did, he did like two or three Seinfeld. But everyone grabs his arm and screams, the Van Buren boys. To be <laughs> he started a New York gang of an obscure president. <laughs> I mean, that's absurdity at its finest, isn't it? You it know? really is. That's awesome, though, that, <laughs> that you had the opportunity to meet somebody like that, though. You know, I, I, I'm definitely envious. <laughs> oh, sure, but, but, I mean, when you look at what the effect Seinfeld had at that time, I mean— Seinfeld, Bizarro was almost forgotten, you know, even at DC Comics. Mm -hmm. When they did the Bizarro Jerry episode of, of uh, Seinfeld, suddenly Bizarro was big business again, you know? I right, mean, there, yeah. there was a huge renewed interest in that character, you know, in that universe. But, you know, it, it's so crazy that, that that show was literally a show about nothing, but it, it was so, you couldn't not watch it. It was like a train wreck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or a can of Pringles. You couldn't just watch one of them. And, and exactly. there was a, I, I remember they were binging reruns. They were binging reruns when I was working on my first book. And you'd think, oh, damn, oh, damn, okay, I'm, I'm going to just watch this one. And, and, oh, 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 it's the, the mannequin Elaine. You know, and you'd find yourself <laughs> falling into a, like a Seinfeld marathon. I literally had the ch Whenever you're writing, you got to shut off the TV and just turn up the radio and just try to focus on the work. You know? Right. Yeah. So we've been sitting here yammering on about Seinfeld. And <laughs> I feel bad because this is supposed to be about you. We're breaking the fourth wall about you. We're, I want to know more I'm about you. I'm honored to talk about anything you want to talk about, Ray. I'm at your disposal for the next 30. <laughs> nice, nice. So, all right, you, you're you an actor. You it, it looks like you've done a little bit of production work. You're a writer. Um so I got to ask of those things, you know, which one are you most drawn to? What do you like to do the most? Well, I feel like acting is stealing under false pretenses. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean <laughs> okay. You know, you, you, you get in there, you be funny or do whatever they want you to do. So I always say the writing, the writing is more of a challenge, whereas the, uh, the acting is fun. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, but the writing is you and your underpants at three o'clock in the morning trying to get stuff done. <laughs> and to me, that's, that's real effort. There's no effort to being on a movie set. And then, you know, knowing that there's, you can smell the hot coffee from craft service five feet away. I mean, there, yeah, there, I there's some, <laughs> there's some movies out there where you'd be in your underpants at 3 a.m., but this is a family show, so we won't get into that. <laughs> That's in the valley, though. You're with a hyper tan woman, usually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. They shoot those in the valley, and I'm pretty sure they don't have a craft service table. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want Ron Jeremy looking fat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's cool, though. What What... You know, what made you decide to get into all this different stuff, you know, getting into writing and just the creativity of it? I mean, was this something well, that happened I, back in school? or? I think that's always been part of the way. I mean, uh, uh, my big brother, my late brother Tom, was a big influence on me. And he, he and I shared a room, and we did a lot of, you know, uh, um, we wrote together. You know what I mean? We wrote, we, we sold some short stories together and stuff, and then... Uh, uh, when he, in college, he started writing scripts, and so I started writing those, too, and we got stuff optioned, and it was he was just a huge influence on me, and I found, I got my SAG card in college. I got my SAG card writing a commercial with Tom and my brother Donald for David Lynch, you know, the director, David yeah. Lynch. Yeah, And I, th I thought that would get me in the Writers Guild, and instead it got me in the Screen Actors Guild. Oh, geez. <laughs> You know, so it was kind of fun because I kind of fell into it. And I'm six foot nine. So, you know what I mean? I mean, so I, it was pretty easy to land goon roles here and there. You know what right. I mean, I mean uh, uh, so your goon thug, I, uh, if you look at my IMDb, there's like goon thug maniac bouncer. <laughs> Any role that a six foot nine guy would fall his way into. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. just just right here, uh, you know, because I have it pulled up. I mean, like, big kids, it just says creepy guy one. Creepy <laughs> I mean, guy one. The great thing about that is that was a pilot, and I'm harassing a waitress. And, <laughs> <laughs> and 
they, they, they go, they, they give me creepy guy two and three who are, yeah, yeah, whatever I say. I'm insulting the waitress, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm being just a total creep, lonesome creep to the waitress. And uh, uh, the hero, the hero comes over, and I'm sitting at a bar stool, and the hero grabs me and spins me around to, you know, points a finger at me. I stand up and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a funny pilot, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, but yeah, lots of stuff like that. There was, I did one where the, the label was rapist, and I'm going, can we call it a maniac? Just, I don't know yeah, what a rapist is. Yeah. Like, a <laughs> yeah. I, I imagine that would get some, some eyebrow lifting if, if somebody was reading through like, uh, I'm not sure we want this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're shooting in the, we're shooting in the director's basement and we're coming up and his pregnant wife is watching must-see TV while we're doing <laughs> heinous things downstairs. <laughs> oh, geez. That was kind of surreal. <laughs> well, I think at that point, that's when you just have to... Uh, kind of steal from Saturday Night Live and be like, oh, no, 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 no. There's supposed to be a space in there. That's supposed to be therapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know what I mean? I mean I'm like, can we, can we call it that? Like, like, like uh, uh, yeah, you, you know, call it anything but that. Well, you maniac, wild man, mugger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Like, that. that's, that's a rough word, to, you know. That you... Yeah, my mom didn't raise me to be playing the R word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's crazy. That that sounds like a whirlwind of of uh, adventure, though. Like going through all that stuff and m- making your way through the world of acting. It sounds like you've definitely well, had an adventure. It is. It's fun. It, I mean, uh, it's it's fun because it's weird. It's different. You know what I mean? And it always it's always fun to say somebody else's words and all that. And you know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, I just I love the whole vibe of a set. I, I love the whole atmosphere of going on a movie set. You know, uh, I, I have a routine. I, I was a teenage set crasher, and I started crashing like horror movie sets when I was in high school. Oh, okay. And my format has been basically in, on any set, even when I'm doing a commercial or something. You go in, you get a donut, and you get a uh, and you get a cup of hot set coffee. Set coffee isn't like normal coffee. Set coffee is scalding. You wouldn't oh. get this at Starbucks. They make this, to, <laughs> yeah. But the, remember, because usually it's a late night shoot, they're making it to keep the crew awake. My brother Don, God love him, he can make set coffee the way we've been drinking it since we were kids, where it's super hot and super strong, and one good cup of coffee and you're up for the next nine or ten hours. You know. Oh, oh, I need some of that. <laughs> yeah, that's a season. So the crew knows they're, they're, the crafty guys, the craft service guys know they've got to keep the crew awake. And bad or weak coffee will make you sluggish. Strong coffee will keep you strong. You know. Yeah. And I, I'm right. I try to make it the way my brother does it. And you know, like if I'm on an all night writing job, you know what I mean. You you don't want to be punching around two or three in the morning. You want to be able to finish up strong. You know. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's Thank the way you. to do it. <laughs> Now, it's, it's, nowadays, it's they it's just like, make the coffee that way, like Death Wish. They're like, here you go. <laughs> but that's good, though. I mean, to me, strong coffee will get you, you know, you know this. You do this uh, show. You got to do interviews. You're probably up late running questions. Strong coffee will keep you working away. And you're lucky enough to live in New York. New York has some of the strongest coffee on earth, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gratuitous amounts of energy. <laughs> exactly. I mean, my mom, my mom's side of the family is from Seattle, and they love, love, love strong coffee out there. You know. Right. Yeah. I mean, anywhere that it's it's dreary and rainy, ninety percent of the year, you kind of need, you know, a pick me. Yeah, up. something to keep you up and at them, basically. And and you're right. As sluggish and and uh, and wet and depressing as the weather is, if the coffee is hot and strong, it gets you going. You know. Yeah. So if. Uh... Somebody were to come up to you and say, "Hey, man, I am doing this movie, and I want you in it." What movie would you hope that they would say? Wow, it's just well, usually uh, a nice mugger song sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not proud. I mean, uh, I love. I love I love creepy guy in bars. Always because <laughs> creepy guy in bar gets to be obnoxious. I love, uh, I, just, uh, you know what I mean? 
just an annoying side piece, you know, like a, a bouncer or a thug or something. It's always a lot of fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's a pretty fair answer. I, Thank I you. Was, I was, <laughs> it's a very uh, political answer. <laughs> uh, well, you know what I mean? I, mean I, I, I know my strengths, you know. It's commercials. It's either, like, barbarian or bouncer, you know what I mean? Uh, that's fair. That's fair. But there's no there's no particular movie in general that you really wish that you could play. Honestly, no. I, you know, to me, I'm just I'm go along, get along. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean uh, in terms of, uh, I've always been afraid of Bigfoot when I was a kid. You know, because my mom is from the Pacific Northwest, so oh, ever okay. since yeah, I was like yeah. six, and we we saw like a Bigfoot museum. So I just did a Bigfoot gig, a, a movie that came out this summer, hoax came out last month. Oh, nice. You know, to be a Bigfoot and killing name actors, that was a blast. (laughs) (laughs) This sounds like that was right up your alley then. It was totally up my alley. I mean, uh, uh, to kill most Bigfoot movies are nobody you've ever heard of. So to have have a a Bigfoot movie with Adrian Mabeau and Ben Browder and Brian Thompson and Shel Texel and all these other people I've heard of going out to look for Bigfoot and finding him, that's a blast, man. You know, and, and I'm already into Bigfoot anyway. So, so to, to go up to this tiny Colorado town and be a Bigfoot, that I really enjoyed. You know. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so yeah, here's here's one. And be, oh, good. Here's one for you. Since we're on Please. this, since we're on this subject, so you you have a affinity for Bigfoot. You are also mm-hmm. six foot nine, so you're pretty much Bigfoot anyway. That's if, what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody came up to you, given what's going on uh, with movies this current day and age, somebody comes up to you, any, any director, I can't even think of a, a director off the top of my head, but they come up to you and they say, all right, Pat, I got this script, and I want you to do it. And they put it down in front of you, and it says, Harry and the Hendersons, the remake. Would you, you know go what? for it? Oh, hell yeah, because Kevin Peter Hall, I think even more than Doug Jones, I think Kevin Peter Hall was the suit guy. You know, if you're looking at one creature actor who made a difference, Kevin Peter Hall was Harry the Hendersons, and the exact same summer, he was the alien in Predator. He was the Predator. I mean, to do Harry the Hendersons, by the way, Harry the Hendersons shot my grandmother's neighborhood of Wallingford, Washington. You see my grandma's food giant when they drive by. So I'm looking, I was looking for Harry when he gets loose. That's he awesome. He drives by my grandmother's food giant. <laughs> Dang. So but that's, that's the Hall. role you are meant to play right there. Somebody better be listening to this and better be getting to for work God's on a sake, script. For God's sake, once grandma's food giant was on that screen, man, I, that became one of my favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like... My only problem with Harry Henderson's is he was friendly. I, I've always liked the more the more angry Bigfoot. I, there, there are two types of Bigfoot movies, okay? People find Bigfoot, or Bigfoot finds them. You know, right. uh, you know, you do the scientist looking for him, or you do a bunch of teens partying in the woods and Bigfoot wanders in. So right. those are the two types of Bigfoot movie. And and Harry and the Henderson starts out like that. I, I love the scene where he's mad he got hit by the car and he's coming at John Lithgow. To me, if he tore John Lithgow apart, it would have been the perfect movie. But, you know, they, they went and made an E.T. with Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I imagine if you had, like, the Jack Lynx Bigfoot in the Harry and the Hendersons, I, I don't think that movie would have gone the I same. Know it's very painful <laughs> to me. I was... The, the, you know, during one of the Jack Links commercials, one of the guys who did the costumes was doing another Bigfoot gig, and the, I was too big for the costume. I was so hard working <laughs> by that they couldn't even get the head over my head. I mean, uh, you know what I mean? I mean that was that was heartbreaking. Especially I know how well my friend is doing in those spots. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so being so tall, like, do you ever find just normal everyday stuff difficult to do? Well, I'm probably the only guy who's been pulled over by cops because they wanted to see if anyone was driving because I have to put the seat all the way back. <laughs> you know, I drive a Honda right now through financial concerns, and, and I'll put the chair all the way back, and the cop will pull you over because he, he goes, I thought you were drowsy, but I see you're just trying to see. 
<laughs> oh man, that's impressive. Yeah, that's uh, they're they're very amused by that. And of course, they, then they'll ask you after doing the license and handing everything back, and they go, "Could you step out of the car? I just want to see how tall you are." <laughs> you know, and so man. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm there. Here we go. Do you not know how hard it is to get in and out of this Honda? <laughs> Listen, if it beats a ticket, I'll do anything he asks me to. All right, I mean, there you uh, are. <laughs> I when I was in high school, when we moved to California, and I was in high school, I remember um, I was stopped by Japanese tourists in the park. I was taking my uh, uh, cousins, my cousins and I were going to Universal Studios tour. You mm -hmm. know, they were visiting. And Japanese tourists wanted a picture with me, like I was Goofy or Mickey Mouse, because <laughs> they wanted to show they'd seen how tall somebody was, and that that freaked me out a little bit, because that's that's it's like weird fame for nothing you've done, you know what I mean? But <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, he just this just being you. And if we, they park too close to the curb, this is an old family trick, because my brothers and I are all pretty tall. Like my, my uncle Jerry on the same trip. We went to La Brea Trumpets, and he pulled too close to the curb, and I couldn't get out of the passenger door. So I had him unroll the window, and I just stepped out of the car on the sidewalk. And people started taking pictures of that because it's a common <laughs> occurrence in our family, but they've never seen that before. <laughs> you know, I, just, I literally put my leg out the window onto the ground and pulled myself out of the car. And, you know, to them, it looked like a gorilla escaping or something. <laughs> you know, so. Oh, man, that bear's getting out of the car. Look at that. <laughs> The hard part is you banging your head. The, the, through my teenage years, banging my head against different, the small, the, the lowest tree branch. You know, in high school, working at Wendy's, you'll bang your head on top of the grill. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, man. Cause, yeah, you just, you know, and I, visiting, visiting a foreign country is hell. Uh, <laughs> I bumped my head all through England. Uh, and I was in England. And I had to, to get in the shower, I had to get on my knees to shower in England in Bayswater. <laughs> oh, my gosh. See, that, that's what I'm talking call. about right there. Like, just an everyday thing that most of us take for granted becomes a chore for you. Yeah, but you know what I mean? I mean, it, it's fine. I mean, uh, I'd rather be asked why you're so tall than, hey, how'd you lose that eye? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> well, if you got to pick it. one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, to me, it's... I'm fine with it. I mean, being asked every day if you play ba basketball, you know, that would get a bit much. But getting kissed by a beautiful redhead in uh, in uh, the the in the getting kissed by a beautiful redhead in the parking lot because she thought you were Paul Gasol of the Lakers that doesn't suck, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I didn't bother to correct her. <laughs> no, no, not at all. My brother goes, "You're not Paul Gasol," you know, and I told Donald. I just want my brother Donald, of course, he's in my snarky reality check on everything. I said, I just want to imagine Paul Gasol getting into his Porsche with a Laker girl under each arm, and somebody runs up and tells him how much they liked his article in Starlog or Fangoria. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you and your brother <laughs> both live out there in California then? We do. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, my college campus. It's funny, when I, when I went to Cal State San Bernardino, and my college campus, there was a long scar running through the campus. And I assumed it was they were going to put it on a sidewalk or something. And they, they planted pansies on both sides of this long, ugly scar that ran across campus. And right before I graduated, I realized after we had a quake on campus, it was uh, that ugly scar running through the middle of campus was the San Andreas Fault, the famous San Andreas Fault. Oh, wow. And I remember one of my professor, professors said, uh, if Professor Golden, I remember him telling us this in Fowl Library, he said, if the big one hits, <laughs> <laughs> if the big one hits, you won't have time to tell anybody because it's going to run right through the campus. You'll be dead before anyone hears about it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> He was a very really dark cat, that Bruce Golden. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's insane! What <laughs> what prompted you guys? Because you said your 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 mom is in or from Seattle. Was was that something, or am I making things up again? No, no, go ahead. Uh, the phone broke up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just. You said your mom is either in Seattle or moved from Seattle. Oh or? no, no, my mom. My mom was from Seattle. My, you know, um, 
No, when we were kids, uh, uh, we were in Detroit. I was born and raised in Detroit. Oh, okay. And then when when the uh, my father was an automotive engineer, there's Chrysler cars that still use a part he designed for the door on the road today. Oh, wow. And uh, I know, I was kind of impressed. Yeah, that's and cool. The, and in the 80s, when the auto uh, auto industry took a header, my father just switched to an aerospace engineer and came out to work for General Dynamics. So, to me, to leave dreary Detroit to go to sunny, sunny Southern California was just, it was such a, a weird culture shock, you know? Right, yeah. That's got to be, that's like a 180 right there. A complete, uh, more like a 360. You're all, turn, <laughs> your head is turned all the way around. I mean, I haven't seen a mosquito in years. You know, there's no mosquitoes out here. Uh, uh, there's no snow unless you go up to the mountains to go skiing. It's perfect, you know? Yeah. Well, I know where I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, trust me. Trust me. Except for our current $4 gas boondoggle, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Oh, uh, so. But yeah, it's a beautiful. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Rick. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to live. You know what I mean? I mean, it's expensive, but it's beautiful. You know. Yeah. So our our family came out here, and uh, my parents are gone now, and uh, uh, my brothers and I are all out here. And my, I have a sister who, and her and her husband, also an aerospace engineer, live in Seattle, and love the hell out of that. You know. Mm-hmm. You know, so between. I, it seems the two states I visit the most are Seattle and or Washington and, and of course here. You know? Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I'm I'm very impressed that you've had the career that you've had, and it, it sounds like it's been fun, regardless of if they were major parts or anything like that. It sounds <laughs> like you you have had fun, and that's yeah. It's been a very fun life, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. You know. That that's sorely lacking these days. Most people just, you know, they go to work, they make their money, they give their money to the government, they spend their money, they go to work to get more money. You know what I mean? It's this endless cycle, and it sounds like you've actually had fun out there doing what you want to do. And that's... you gotta well, you you gotta monetize your you got you know you gotta monetize your fun, and that to me that's where the writing and other stuff come in. You know what I mean? I mean one good commercial. You know, it, it doesn't feel like work, and then it covers everything for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool. you know. And I, I've done a podcast on the side, the Jeff and Janky Show, with my friend Jeff Sargent. You know, and and uh, Steve Joyner has been great for us there. He's he's actually booked us a lot of great guests. You know. Yeah, same here. Steve's just Steve's been great. He he's definitely. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. So. There, oh, shit. There's there's <laughs> our there's our plug for Steve. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there you go, Steve. Uh, there, Steve, San Diego, Steve. We call him now. <laughs> <laughs> Much love. He's close to the Comic Con, which is uh, the center of the pop culture universe every summer. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but uh, we're coming up on the end of the show, so I'd like to take these last few minutes to kind of. Um, let you go through like i said in the beginning I, I would like for you to kind of spell out your last name so people know what they're typing in to come and find you and where they can go to look you up oh sure sure uh my name is pat A-T, jankowitz j-a-n-k-i-e-w-i-c as in cat z as in zebra yeah uh, uh I know some old school, old country guys pronounce it Yank Cabbage, but we Americanized it. You know, I remember one of my book reviews, uh, one of the first reviews of one of my first books, Pat Jankowitz, and they looked me up on, on YouTube or something, you know, being interviewed about one of the books, and they said, who does not pronounce his last name correctly, and I'm thinking, according to who, pal? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This has been an absolute great interview. You, you just, your laugh is infectious. <laughs> oh, thank you, Raymond. You were uh, a charming interviewer, a lot of fun, and uh, I enjoyed this, actually. Yeah. I'm not going to remember you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of people that are very confused right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, folks, is what's called an in-joke. <laughs> But that that's great. Um, so what were the names of uh, the books that you said you had done, just so that people can get it one more time so they can go check it out? God love you, sir. Anyone who wants to help me plug my books, I'm A-OK with. 
Uh, it's just when you thought it was safe for Jaws Companion. It's carried at some of your better genre bookstores. You could also order it on Amazon or from Bear Manor Books. Same with uh, You Wouldn't Like Me When I'm Angry, A Hulk Companion, a two-pound book about the Incredible Hulk TV series, forward by Lou Ferrigno. And uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, a TV companion, forward by the enchanting Aaron Gray. So you can get those off of Amazon or your better, hipper comic shops than sci-fi bookstores. There you have it. <laughs> Ray, was... it's been a true pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've had a great time. I want to thank you one more time for coming on the show and having a few good laughs and telling us a little more about yourself. It, it, you're, you seem like an awesome guy, and I hope that uh, maybe this helps get your name out there a little more. Maybe we can land you that uh, Harry and the Hendersons uh, <laughs> remake. <laughs> From your lips to God's ear. It was, it was a blast breaking the fourth wall with you. Good luck in your show, my friend. Thank you very much, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Breaking the Fourth Wall, and we will see you later. Oh, yeah.